Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Reach the World's live stream series as a part of the Endurance 22 expedition. I am Chris Ahern, Director of Partnerships here at Reach the World in uh, what I'm glad to say is beautiful and sunny New York City as, um, as we have a chance to, to learn a little bit more about this incredible expedition that we have been following with bated breath for weeks and weeks. Um, I was actually just speaking with our friend Tim Jacob on board the SA Gullis II. Um, they are, they, it seems as though they will be making their way back to Cape Town over the weekend, um, where, where they are really excited, I think, to be, on, uh, to be on land for the first time in a little bit rather than ice or, or the ship. And, uh, and so we'll have some really fantastic updates with him very, very shortly. Now, I would love to, uh, I'm going to introduce to you a very special person who I am so excited to introduce to you all today. Uh, he is, is someone that we at Reach the World and, and those of us who have been deeply involved in the expedition um, have, have known for a while, but I don't think he's as well known to you all, our amazing teachers and students. Uh, and so I want to give a chance for him to introduce himself how, why, how, and why he's involved in this incredible expedition, and 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 then we'll jump into some really cool questions. We have two amazing groups of students live on camera that will be joining us later in the presentation. Um, I would also like to to say hello and welcome to all of you who are out there on YouTube and and following us today. Um, please tell us where you are in uh, where you were tuning in from in the chat. We would love to be able to do that. I see some amazing questions. We'll try and get to those as they as they come up. Um, but but we're really excited to to, um, to to speak with you all today. So with that, um, I would love to introduce you all to my friend. Uh, his name is Donald Lamont, and um, and and Donald, tell us a little bit about you and and how and how you are involved in this amazing expedition. Well, for Many years I was in the British diplomatic service um, and from time to time I had um, contact with people dealing with uh, Antarctica. Uh, and that was particularly true in one of my jobs. I was um, governor of the Falkland Islands, uh, the islands just off the tip of South America. And uh, because of that role, again, I became deeply kind of involved with different organizations dealing with Antarctica. Uh, and a few years ago, um, a, a, a nonprofit organization uh, that I chaired uh, conducted a search for, not in Antarctica, but near the Falkland Islands, uh, for warships that were sunk in the First World War. Uh, that was successful. Uh, and so we had the opportunity a few years later, um, someone said, why not organize a search for endurance in the Weddell Sea? Uh, and so we said, that sounds a good idea. And off we went. Amazing. Uh, I, I think it was an excellent idea. Speaking as a former middle school social studies history teacher, I, 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 love, I love the fact that it's like, well, why don't we do this? And and I have to say, I'm so glad that you did because we wouldn't be here celebrating such an incredible accomplishment had it not been for that. Um, so so can um, so let's just jump into to some of these questions. Let's talk a little bit about the the beginning of this Endurance 22 expedition. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit about the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust role on the expedition for our students and 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 tell us a little bit about where where the idea came about. It, 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 I mean, were you just sitting outside one day and it just it dropped on you like like the apple with Newton, or <laughs> a bit like that? No, I think um, if if we go back kind of a number of years, um, I was in a charity that um, is a non-profit organisation, like that that supports the museum uh, in the Falkland Islands, uh, and someone approached us and said you know, I would be kind of willing to give money to do a search for these warships uh, that were sunk in World War I. Um, and we thought, well, our organization is not really set up to do stuff like that. Um, and so we set up a new organization 
uh, that was kind of um, set up so that it could engage kind of people on contract to do uh, the sort of searching that would be needed. We had in mind then, about four or five years ago, uh, that maybe one day we might be involved in a search for endurance, uh, but really the, the focus was on these uh, warships. Then about um, three years ago, just a little bit more, I began to um, see emails about an expedition to the Weddell Sea, uh, and um, I became involved in that just as an individual. It wasn't our organization, uh, but I became involved partly because I had I knew people who dealt with Antarctic matters, uh, and so maybe I could give advice or you know, help with the contacts. Uh, that expedition, the Weddell Sea expedition, uh, 2019, um, provided a lot of lessons, um, if you like. It was unsuccessful in its aim in that they didn't find endurance. Um, but the fact that we, the Heritage Trust, A, had the experience of the search for the warships, and B, that it was clear that we had the contacts in Antarctica and could build on the experience of the people involved in the unsuccessful search, that meant we had a, you know, a chance with the right backing uh, to put together uh, an expedition that maybe um, had a chance of succeeding. That is that is fascinating, and and I think it's it. It, it's so interesting to me that it, that so much of this came out of the the work and interest in in closer to the to the Falklands where it was a search you know looking at the the warships that had um, that hadn't been identified or, or recovered um, in those areas and and it, it makes sense because I, I know our there are some amazing organizations it, um, that are a part of the expedition that have lent their expertise including many of whom who have some of that previous expertise in that. So uh, it, it, it all comes together in a, in a very amazing way. Um, so I'd love to, I'm sorry, what? No, absolutely right. It, it, it really come, all come together is absolutely the right way of expressing it. Exactly. And, it, and, and speaking as a former teacher, it's the thing I think of is the importance of, of finding the right people together to do group work, right? That, that it's group work is really hard. But the ability for us to for 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 you know to be able to bring the right people together who know and understand have the right level of expertise is really important and very similar to what a lot of students are doing when they're trying to put together their projects on different things. Many of whom are doing projects that are related to Endurance Twenty Two because they are following this incredible expedition. Um, so I'd like to bring in one of our classrooms. So I'm gonna we're gonna bring Mr. Tomlinson's classroom on uh, on screen from from Pennsylvania, and I think he has a student who wants to ask a question a little bit about that the the genesis of of the the Endurance 22 expedition. Sure. Go ahead. If you plan something like this again, what would you do differently? Ooh, that's oh that's a tricky one. Um, because I'll tell you what, well, it's tricky for a number of reasons. One, I was just today over lunchtime, um, I was thinking about how you can learn from things that, learn from your mistakes, learn from failure, learn from things that haven't gone well. What do you then do when it actually is successful? <laughs> Uh, this expedition has been successful. Um, and I, so it's quite difficult. You can, you look back, um, and we haven't had much time to look back, to be honest. You know, the, the, the ship is sail, still sailing in to, towards Cape Town. Uh, but we'll all sit down and, and we will discuss what went well, which was almost everything, um, and what didn't go so well. Uh, I don't think we'll be doing another expedition of the same sort, but it may be that we'll do an expedition, for example, to find other warships near the Falklands or something of that sort. And I think we'd probably look at what went well and build on that. Uh, and if there were um, people who were particularly successful, make a note that, yes, we want them. If they weren't, you know, 
if they were not so happy or if they didn't work so well with others, then you would look to, to perhaps uh, appointing someone else. Uh, but really, it, it, it's not arrogant to say, you know, this expedition was very successful. Um, so there are not many mistakes that we would want to uh, or need to, to go back and, and reflect on. I, I think there's something too. I think, by the way, great, great question, uh, Mr. Tomlinson's yeah. uh, class. Sure. We didn't, we didn't get the the student's name, but but very, very excellent question. Um, I think the the piece that I would probably add in for um, for your students um, would also be that it's it's about taking what worked well and um, and trying to understand how to adapt, how to make it work in a different circumstance and in a different situation. Uh, if you were to search for something else that uh, that 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 was similarly important to history, uh, because, for example, uh, just to use your to use your example um, of of using the right people, that Captain Knowledge Bengu, who has been this incredible ice pilot and captain, who who was also the captain aboard the Agulhas in 2019, if if you aren't looking for something in the ice, he may not be the right person as good as he was. So it's about adapting and adjusting the, the circumstances. Uh, can, I, can I add a supplementary? Sure. Chris? Yeah, because if, if we go back to, I mentioned the Weddell Sea Expedition of 2019, um, Reach the World was involved in that expedition, but not having someone from Reach the World actually on the ship. Uh, there was someone else who had a different job, if you like, who did a lot of really very good work for Reach the World. But because she had another job, she was under an awful lot of pressure. Um, and <coughs> uh, we thought, well, that's, that's unfair. And we don't want to repeat that. So on this occasion, um, we said to Reach the World, would you like to send someone of your own? Team. And, and so that, you know, that is a, if you like, a lesson learned and something I think we did better this time than was done on the uh, expedition three years ago. I think that's a, it's a great example of, of that, um, of that. And, and also in that, that fits into, we have um, one of our, one of our groups that are joining from Brazil on, on YouTube asked that question about the differences in planning between 2019 and 2022. And I think that's an, an excellent example of, of the thinking about taking what went well, taking what wasn't, um, what, what could be improved upon. Uh, and and doing that and and I, I I do need to say just because you mentioned her I, this is a shout out to our friend Holly Ewart who who was our amazing voice on board the the 2019 What Else the Expedition um, and we 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 still keep in touch with her and think and think the world of her uh, but but we were very glad to have Tim on board this time around for sure let's bring in Miss Schaefer's class um, in New Jersey and see if we have a student we have any student questions there. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Shlok and I want to ask like, what was your organization called and did it do anything besides find warships? Okay, yeah, we're the, the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust. Uh, the Falkland Islands, I've explained kind of where they are. You, there was a map up on, on the screen. Uh, maritime heritage is kind of a rather posh way uh, of speaking about history and history to do with the sea. Um, around the Falkland Islands, there are a lot of wrecks uh, because the waters down in that part of the world are particularly stormy. And if you go back kind of a, blah, a 150 years or so, a lot of sailing ships, before there were steamships and ships powered by diesel or whatever, you, the sailing ships would come round the tip of South America, very often were damaged, uh, and would come to the Falkland Islands to be repaired, or some of them didn't make it, and they sank. And so there are loads and loads of stories there. And we have begun kind of on our website to tell the stories of some of these uh, ships, um, so that uh, Falkland Islanders know more about their own history, and other people around the world can learn more about the Falkland Islands. So I think um, we, uh, if we're not going to go after more uh, warships or s s sunken ships like that, there is still work to be done to tell stories of all these uh, historic ships that, um, 
you know, that, that were lost in storms or sank because of, uh, of the damage that, that was inflicted. And I, I think it's just important to mention, especially while we have the map up here, that 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 point, um, we have that little point in the arrow, that little, little um, speck of land right there, that's the Falklands. Um, and and you can see that it's really close to the southern tip of South America. And and that area, like like Donald was explaining, is is extremely dangerous. Only it, only the, the best sailors can really navigate the waters through that passage coming around the around that that southern tip. Uh, known as Tierra del Fuego, um, and it's and so it is it is a it is an area I want to make sure for all of you, and this is me as being a former geography teacher that that we want to understand that that's why that the Falklands uh, has this amazing connection to maritime heritage because it was such a dangerous area to sail for for many many years until they built a canal in Central America a little bit farther uh, a little bit farther up, so ships didn't have to make it all the way around. Uh, and so ships still do that sometimes too. And so the the importance of understanding that is really it, it's really fascinating. And um, maybe Chris, maybe while the map is 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 on the screen, if if you look a little bit to the right uh, of the Falklands, and um, it really looks like just a speck on the screen or whatever, but actually there is the island of South Georgia. Um, and if you've been following this, you will know that the uh, uh, that the ship, the uh, Agulhas II, called in South Georgia because that was the place where Ernest Shackleton uh, ended up, kind of in the, um, he escaped from Antarctica, went to a place, Elephant Island off Antarctica, uh, and then an extraordinary kind of uh, journey in, the, in a lifeboat uh, to that tiny little speck um, that's called South Georgia. Uh, and they crossed the mountains there, which are very high and very rough, uh, got to uh, a place where there were other people, and from there they could launch a rescue uh, of the, the men who'd been left on Elephant Island. Uh, and you can see it's quite a long distance from South Georgia to South Africa, to Cape Town, where uh, the ship is, um, is now heading, where it's very close. Uh, but South, South Georgia is a, a stunningly beautiful uh, and place, and, and the team on board, Agullus, were delighted to have the opportunity uh, to go there uh, to visit the grave where Sir Ernest Shackleton is uh, is buried, and and we've we've illuminated uh, in the map. You can see there where where Cape, where South Africa is in Cape Town. You can imagine it's on that on the southern tip of of South Africa. Um, and and just for everyone's knowledge, the our this map doesn't actually include Antarctica on it. So you can imagine that it's so it's so far south in this map that it's not actually even there. Uh, and so, and so that's just an idea for all of you about um, about the distance that that both the SA Gullis II has traveled, but also the incredible distance that that the that Sir Ernest Shackleton and his crew managed to travel in order to to be rescued. That they were they were off the map, this map that we're showing you in Antarctica, and then they had to make their way essentially on the map in nothing more than a rowboat in, in extremely dangerous seas to be able to be rescued, which is why we, we value that story so much. I'd, I'd like to, to shift now just to our, uh, another topic, which is about putting together the team. So, uh, and we've talked a little bit about this in terms of the, uh, the you know understanding what went well and and what what areas you wanted to to, to adjust and make improvements on um, for from the 2019 what else the expedition to to endurance 22 so maybe you can talk a little bit about about the the decision making behind putting together this incredibly uh, wonderful expeditionary team. Well, yes, it's um, I suppose that in a way was kind of a large part of, of my role to get the various kind of elements that you need in uh, an expedition to, to put them together. But one thing that kind of is, was um, maybe different in this expedition from some others is that it was very important uh, to us to send out 
messages, to send out news, to send out stories uh, in different ways so that people who are not familiar with the history of uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton, who didn't know maybe much about Antarctica, um, that we could reach them uh, uh, and, um, and give uh, interesting and exciting information uh, about all of that. And really, kind of what um, the way this happened was that I thought, well, uh, Reach the World um, had a really exciting approach to uh, getting information and the faces of explorers and scientists into classrooms. Uh, so let us start with that. Um, on the other side of the Atlantic, if you like, my side of the Atlantic in, in the United Kingdom, uh, there is a, an outfit called the Royal Geographical Society. And they have a rather different approach, but they also produced a lot of material for the Weddell Sea Expedition about Antarctica and about the expedition. I thought, well, let's give them another opportunity uh, to engage with this expedition. And in the middle, kind of, I kind of wanted to find some organization that would work well with both Reach the World and the Royal Geographical Society and would um, kind of magnify um, the effort um, that those two organizations were making in order to bring stories to the biggest audience possible. Um, and so we, um, we found uh, a company, if you like, called Little Dot, uh, linked with a, uh, another company, History Hit, which is uh, um, created by a British television presenter and historian, Dan Snow. Uh, and we talked to them and got to know them. Uh, they um, talked to reach the world, uh, and what came out of that seemed very positive. Uh, and so you you move forward uh, and make a judgment. Kind of, you think, right, these people can work well together. Um, so let's sign them up, if you like. Uh, we'd be very um, pleased if they joined the uh, expedition. Uh, similar work was going on on the engineering side. Uh, we managed to... Um, get someone called Nico Vincent, who I think you may you may have seen on your screens. Uh, and he is experienced in kind of underwater searches, subsea searches. He very carefully put together uh, the best experts, the best people that he knew uh, from his experience uh, in conducting uh, subsea searches. And also, thank you for the cue, this kind of rather nice photograph um, of the Sabretooth, uh, the underwater robot or some called drone uh, that would actually carry out physically kind of the search and film. Uh, and that was new. Um, the the, the, the um, Weddell Sea Expedition used technology that is slightly older. Uh, the Sabretooth is, is, is newer. Um, and has kind of worked e extremely well. Um, now, I'm no expert in kind of saber tooths or, or others. You have to rely on uh, people that you get to know and you think, you know, can I have confidence in what you're saying to me and what you know and in what judgments you're making, uh, confidence in who you are selecting. Uh, and... Uh, you know, other people who would participate. For example, we needed a doctor. You have to have a doctor uh, for an expedition in any kind of difficult um, uh, situation. Uh, you interview people, you talk to them, and you think, well, um, is this person competent? Uh, and will they cooperate well within a, a team? So it's a really interesting um, process. Uh, of trying to judge uh, whether people will cooperate effectively. After all, on a on a ship um, where you're limited, you, you know, there's no escape. <laughs> you're limited. You kind of have to get on with everyone. And if people are not going to cooperate, then you're not going to succeed. 
I, I, I think that's such a great lesson that we can all continue to learn and remember to learn that if, if you're not going to cooperate, you're not going to succeed. And we've heard a lot from Tim and, and so many other folks aboard the SAA goals too about the incredible unity that they've been able to have and, and work and, and be so successful in working together. Um, we, I, I, I think that's that we, we actually haven't had a chance to speak um, directly with Nico Vincent, but we, we have her um, spoken with other members of the, of the subsea search team. Yeah. And um, we've seen, we've definitely seen photos of Nico, uh, but I, <laughs> uh, but, but I, I am completely in awe of the work and, and, tirelessness that they did working 24 seven while the, while the search was underway. Um, so I, I want to mention two things. Number one, um, I do want to quickly mention, um, because I do see there on the screen, um, a, a small hello to Paul, um, who is, uh, joining, a, who is joining on YouTube on behalf of little dot and history hit. Um, we little dot has been such a wonderful partner. We, we actually shared a, a walkthrough that Dan, um, and, and little dot did, um, on the, on the, uh, the ship to walk through the ship. So our students can really understand the, just the, the absolute stunning size and, and functionality of, of the SA Agalas too. Uh, and we're, we're always thankful to be able to work alongside, uh, alongside Dan, um, and the rest of the little dot team. Um, very quick, I do want to mention uh, a very brief hello to all of the different folks that are joining us from from Texas, Brooklyn, New York, Hillsdale, New Jersey. We have we have people tuning in from Italy, Brazil, Maryland, uh, and South Africa. So we have a very international group joining us, and and welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, I just to, I, before we bring in the students, I wanted to have one very um, one brief follow up question about the team. Um, specifically about um, the, if you could talk a little bit about the, the importance of the selection of uh, John Shears as expedition leader, and then also as of Mensenbound as, uh, as our lead archaeologist. Um, so if you talk a little bit about that, because obviously those, those two people have been really important. <laughs> they, they have indeed. And you can see I'm, I'm grinning at the memory. Um, Quite a few years ago, kind of um, when we were, I suppose, talking about German warships, um, I, in a small group, um, I said, look, if we're ever going to uh, go to Antarctica uh, and search for endurance, uh, the guy uh, that we should get hold of is a guy I've known uh, for several years um, called John Shears. Uh, well, time passed, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I started um, getting these emails about the Weddell Sea expedition. Uh, Menson Bound is, um, I'll come to him in more detail, but he is, he is kind of Falklands born. He is kind of uh, part of, he's a trustee of the uh, Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust. Um, I, I was getting all these emails, and I said, Menson, you must tell me who these people are and what they all do. I have no idea. Uh, so I, in London, had I sat down, had a coffee with Menson. We went through these people, and I said, but who is there who knows about Antarctica? Um, and he said, well, actually, no one. Uh, and I think, well, I said, um, if, if you're going to go to Antarctica on a day, but I think you need someone who knows Antarctica. Uh, and I know the person you need, uh, and the person you need is John Shears. Um, and so John Shears kind of was sitting at home um, quietly in Cambridge doing, you know, whatever, uh, when I rang him up. Now, well, we probably hadn't seen each other for a number of years. And I said, do you want to lead an expedition to Antarctica to find endurance? Uh, well, yes, he did. <laughs> uh, and so John immediately joined the team uh, on the Weddell Sea expedition uh, and was a really successful uh, expedition leader, which is why uh, we, you know, um, he, he was um, appointed to lead this uh, expedition. Menson, uh, Menson Bound was, um, he was born in the Falkland Islands. Uh, he has uh, been involved in searching for uh, wrecked ships, lost ships over uh, many years. 
Uh, and he was the one who kind of helped um, steer us in the direction first of, of the um, uh, being able to secure the funding to conduct the search for the German warships, uh, and then that built into this uh, effort to um, uh, to find endurance. And Benson, over many years, oh, well, this is a very well-timed well um, photograph. Um, over many years, kind of Menson has spent time in libraries, looking at charts, looking at diaries um, of people who were uh, on the original um, expedition when the endurance was was lost, um, and so he he was thoroughly immersed in the detail that was needed. Add that to John's um, Antarctic experience. Uh, and you have a kind of successful uh, duo, but I think they would also say, but add in to make it a trio, Nico Vincent with the kind of um, technology and the the subsea team that were you know, best equipped to, to physically conduct the expedition. Uh, and you've got a trio of, of people, um, a really ideal trio uh, to conduct this um, expedition successfully. I think the important thing to, to highlight here for our students, and, and I'm going to bring in Mr. Tomlinson's class in, in just a moment, um, but I think the important thing here is to show how um, when we're talking about people like, like John Shears and Minson Bound, they're both extremely accomplished people um, themselves, but they have very different sets of skills that Minson, Minson is, is an incredible archaeologist and um, and, and John is, is a, is the, in a lot of ways, uh, while he does, I know he has a doctorate in geography and he's extremely proud of, of that type of work. He, he's, he's been working in expeditions for many, many years. And so to be able to bring in those people and then Nico Vincent, who is, has such a deep expertise in leading sub C teams and the, the technical aspects of manning. Uh, of, of controlling these autonomous underwater vehicles, remote on underwater vehicles, and using them in effectively in a search like this, which was was a massive search grid. Um, that that to be able to bring those different skill sets that complemented one another, I think, is important. So it's like so for for those of you uh, that, that are learners that are watching, remember that the best way to put together a team, a group, is to find people who don't all are the same as you right it's, it's important to bring people who are different and to then and to then allow so each of you have different strengths that that can all contribute toward that whole um i see mr T in mr tomlinson's class we have someone who's who's ready for us to um to ask a question so let's bring let's bring mr tomlinson's class um on on screen to see if uh if you have a question for donald what kind of skills or traits were you looking for when choosing expedition members? Hmm. Well, it, you need a whole range of skills, um, and no one person is going to have all those skills. Um, the um, You have, on the one hand, you need the deep knowledge of the Shackleton expedition. Uh, you need the knowledge of where they think they were, or thought they were, um, when the ship sank. Uh, you need to know about the ship. Um, how would a ship like that behave when it's crushed by ice uh, and then sinks? Um, ships, when they sink, don't go straight down. It's not like a stone that goes straight down if you drop it in the water. Um, a ship will move, it will kind of sink and while it moves in a certain direction. So there's a whole range of different kind of skills around that. Uh, you need someone, you need people who can plan ahead. Uh, Nico Vincent is, he is very different from me uh, and we get on extremely well. Uh, Nico is a planner, a meticulous planner in the sense of what engineering you can do, how you organize, you know, how do you, you can't just turn up somewhere, put a machine in the water and hope it finds the wreck. You have to think now, where is the wreck most likely to be, but we could be wrong. So how do you organize a search 
that gives you the best chance of actually finding it. And that's really difficult. That's really difficult. It's very deep. Um, and uh, part of it is covered by ice. You don't know exactly how the ship behaved when it went down. So there are skills there. And how do you prepare for it? As you, you, you can't just turn up in Antarctica and push this machine over the side. You have to prepare in advance. We had uh, tests, for example, in, in France, um, where some of the companies are, are based, um, to try to work out how you would actually conduct uh, the search. Then you need a whole lot, lot of other skills about navigation. You know, we should think very much about the South African ship, uh, the Agulhas II. It had performed brilliantly on the Weddell Sea expedition. Uh, the South African master, whom yes, I know you have, um, you have uh, have had on the program, uh, and uh, his his team um, have just been outstanding. Um, and they are a credit to to South Africa. They've they've performed brilliantly. Uh, so there are a whole range of of skills. You 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 want someone to to film it, don't you? So again, from within Little Dot, um, you find people who are highly competent in making documentaries, in putting out uh, messages on social media. Uh, you also want still photographs. That's a different skill from, uh, from um, capturing video images. So you want to kind of uh, think, right, who, who will we get to pr produce um, still photographs? So there's a whole range of, um, uh, of uh, activities. And I suppose I'm going back to the earlier question about what you would do differently uh, if we did this again. Um, there's been some really interesting comment about the photographs of the wreck uh, of endurance and what, um, what growth, what kind of creatures you can see there. Well, there's no one on the ship who can give you an answer on that. Mm -hmm. Um, that's going to have to wait till you know till all of the images come back and scientists will be looking. So you 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 could say, okay, if you're going to go back again, make sure you've got a different um, a different team of scientists uh, because this is something we haven't prepared for. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, but but you can only take so many people. You can't cover absolutely every option, every choice. Exactly. And, and I, I see we have some of the images from, from Endurance that were on there mm -hmm. and some of the incredible sea creatures that we found. And, um, and I know um, in, in this, it's an interesting contrast because in, in 2019, we did have some pretty incredible marine biologists on, on, yeah. on the expedition, Dr. Lucy Woodall, um, chief among them. And, uh, and so it, 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 I, I am very excited to, to, have, to be able to see what, what some of the, the, um, those leading biologists say about, about these things once we get all of the amazing media back from the expedition. Um, let's bring in Mr. Tomlinson's class again, if any of your students have any other questions about putting together the team, because um, that was a great question and I wanna know if anyone else has any ideas, any thoughts. How did did COVID affect the planning of the expedition? Sorry, I missed the beginning. Sorry, could you say again? How did COVID affect the planning of the expedition? I missed the a word at the beginning. How did COVID? He's asking COVID. how COVID might have affected. Oh, I've uh, almost planning. forgot. I've almost forgotten about COVID. Yeah, but I shouldn't. I have to say, here in Scotland, we shouldn't forget about it. No, that, that's a, sorry, kind of masks are a problem. You can, um, in planning the Weddell Sea expedition, the, seri the, the most serious difficulty was ice. In planning this expedition, the most serious problems were ice and COVID. Uh, and... I mean, it's difficult now to remember since it all has come out well as far as COVID is concerned. But uh, we had to make um, decide what arrangements we needed to make in South Africa. 
um, it was, which was at a time that international travel was really restrictive, restricted, um, and we had to discuss with the South African um, authorities, how were we going to manage the question of people coming from different countries uh, into uh, South Africa. Uh, at that stage also, um, South Africa had only recently discovered a new variant um, of COVID, the Omicron uh, variant, which um, it at the time seemed would was likely to spread very fast, but it was not certain how serious it would be uh, if you're affected. And then the process kind of, we went through discussions with the South Africans uh, and we moved from a position where if anyone was tested positive, they simply couldn't join the ship, which could have had very serious consequences. Um, some people would be very difficult to replace. Um, but we moved into a situation where we all agreed that the doctor uh, could decide whether someone who had tested positive could come on the ship or not. Uh, in the event, two people tested positive and joined the ship. Uh, but the doctor had been confident that she could manage that successfully. Uh, the ship had uh, very good medical facilities. Um, she had procured the right medicines and had laid down rules about how people would be tested and so on. So she was confident that she could manage it. Um, so we all agreed that these two uh, people could join the ship. They did. Uh, they caused no problem. Uh, and eventually you get to the point that um, uh, they are better, no one else has kind of caught it, and the ship is therefore COVID-free uh, and will be COVID-free when it arrives in, in, uh, in Cape Town um, this evening or tomorrow morning. So thank you. Sorry not to have caught, caught the question. Um, <laughs> rather perverse since you were asking about COVID and properly wearing a mask. Uh, but <laughs> With mask, it's kind of it masks the masks the words as well as, uh, but a very important question. It, it was a really serious issue for us, and um, uh, in fact, you know, there, there was a. We, I haven't spoken much about the scientists uh, on board, who mostly are German. There are some South Africans, uh, and one of the organisations in Germany, the scientific organisation, was inclined to say, none of our people can come with you hmm? because we think the, the COVID risk is, is too high. But we persuaded them that, in fact, we had put very strict measures in place in Cape Town and we had a competent doctor, etc. Anyway, so they, 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 um, uh, they said, fine, yep, our people can indeed uh, join you. But uh, you, you remind me, really, that in the weeks before uh, the expedition started, that was a really serious concern. It, it was, and I, I remember with Reach the World, uh, my colleague Tim, he was, he was in quarantine in, um, uh, in Cape Town, desperately waiting for that, that, that negative test so he could make his way on, on board the ship. And, uh, and, and there was a, a lot of very, very, very tight control and that, in that panic time when everyone's flying into South Africa to, to be able to make it uh, for sure. So uh, we, so I, uh, unfortunately we lost our classroom from New Jersey. And this is a very brief reminder to the chat. If you can, um, if you have any other questions for Donald, please include them. Um, I, uh, I, I do want to, um, we're running, I know we, we start a little bit late, so we, we have the ability to run a little bit later this time. Um, but I, I do want to briefly run into just a quick discussion of um, a little bit of the equipment. Um, Donald, I know you wanted to, to talk a little bit specifically about the helicopter. So if maybe you can briefly talk about that. Um, and then I have a, a couple of questions from the chat that I would love to, to, bring, uh, to bring to close this out. Okay, helicopters. Part of the plan uh, was that suppose you can't get close enough to the wreck site uh, to lower your 
Sabretooth from the ship. And the plan, which we was a really difficult plan to, to develop uh, and to have confidence in, uh, it required two helicopters. Just because of the, the time that it would take, two helicopters that would take people and equipment from the ship out onto the ice, several miles away uh, from the ship. There you would establish a camp, ice camp, if you will, uh, and there you would drill a hole in the ice and lower the saber tooth through that hole. Really difficult stuff, very difficult. Uh, and, and that is something that we practiced in, uh, in the south of France. Uh, but then um, we had a problem uh, in that uh, we needed really two different helicopters, one for the people, and you can, could see it in that image, the Bell helicopter. Uh, but there were all sorts of difficulties around getting the other kind of helicopter, which would be uh, mostly for lifting heavy cargo. And eventually, uh, we located uh, this helicopter called a K-Max, uh, belonging to a company that is based in Alaska. Now, this was only ooh, about three weeks, perhaps, before the... Uh, expedition was due to set off. Uh, so the challenge was to get a helicopter from Alaska, uh, must be more than halfway across the world, but anyway, across to South Africa, uh, which is really complex because uh, a helicopter, unfortunately, can't fly that far. So you have to um, dismantle the helicopter, put it in crates, put that on an aircraft, uh, the aircraft doesn't go there direct, it flies via Germany, uh, it, it, it then comes to Cape Town and you have to put it together again. Uh, and that was done with really a couple of days only uh, to, uh, to spare. Now, although we have used this kind of, the, the K-Max is a kind of rather, it's an unusual looking helicopter, um, uh, partly because it really doesn't carry people, um, it is for lifting things. Um, if you see on television someone putting a, a mast on top of a very high building, this is the ideal kind of helicopter to carry that mast up there and move it into, into position. Now, in fact, we didn't deploy, we didn't use ice camps as, as, as we had thought we might need to because we were lucky uh, in the conditions of uh, that we found uh, in the ice on the ship, uh, the Agullus uh, 2 did get uh, to where we ideally wanted wanted it in uh, on, on what we thought was the the site of the wreck. So um, the helicopter pilots didn't have as much fun um, as, as they might have expected. They did do some flying, uh, but um, and the bell kind of was was very important to taking scientists, for example, out uh, on the ice to to conduct experiments to drill in the ice. Uh, the K-Max had kind of less kind of uh, uh, of an opportunity, but we needed it there in case we we did have the um, uh, the ice camps. I think it's an important element to bring in about the 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 importance of planning and having backup plans and to think, okay, well, if we get there and the ice is too thick, what is our next what is our next opportunity and how do we adjust for that? And uh, the in some ways, the expedition was very lucky that they didn't have to to deal with that. But it's it's it just shows again the the incredible planning with uh, between uh, Nico Vincent on the subsea side with Menson Bound on the archaeological side, John Shear's expeditionary side, obviously Captain Knowledge Bengu and his ice pilots, uh, as well as the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust coming together and making sure that they say, okay, here's our plan A, we'll just sail there. Here's our plan B, we'll fly there, and then and and to to make sure that they not only had the equipment like the K Max, like the the Bell. Uh, but also the ice camps. Uh, I know in, in our tour of the um, of the ship, Dan Snow for, from from Little Dot and History Hit met, pointed out that there were ski doos that were on um, that were on the ship, and and the ice drills themselves, which had had um, sl um, skis that they could actually be adjusted um, essentially by sledging, uh, and and so all of that planning, those meticulous details, I think, really speak to the 
uh, the the importance of this. Now um, we we're running a little low on time, and I there's a really wonderful question from the chat from um, from Allen, Texas, uh, one of our our really dedicated classrooms, uh, asked about um, this really interesting question about um, the the legacy of the Endurance Twenty Two Expedition. So she said. Um, so she wanted to know if, if you knew of um, the reaction of the Shackleton, Worsley, Crean, Wild um, family members of, of the crew of the original Endurance, have you heard from them uh, reacting to, to the location of the ship? Um, and then she also wanted to know when will the, the photos, videos, and documentation of the search be published? Um, I know some of that will be will be through an amazing documentary in partnership with National Geographic, but I think everyone's antsy to see more photos. But before we get to that, um, I would love to know if if you've heard from any of the members of the um, of the families of the the descendants of the the original expedition. Uh, <clears throat> we have, um, <coughs> and and they're really um, enthusiastic, moved, proud. Uh, in South Africa, there are two brothers uh, who are the sons of one of the participants in the expedition. His surname is James. Uh, and his diary, uh, together with those of Worsley, who was the captain and a very skilled navigator, his diaries have been extremely valuable uh, to, to Menson uh, in trying to work out e as exactly as one could. Um, where we should be be looking. So these two, um, now quite elderly, I think gentlemen in South Africa, were in touch with us before the expedition. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we could not organize a meeting with them uh, before the expedition started, but they will kind of touch wood, as we say, uh, knock on wood, as it may um, we, we hope there'll be a meeting kind of in, in Cape Town before the team leaves there. Uh, they've been interviewed by uh, the South African press, and I thought it was a wonderful headline, uh, which, if I remember accurately, was Our Dad's Arithmetic Saved Lies and Found the Endurance. And I think that just as a wonderful comment uh, on what was done uh, and how Menson and the team uh, relied on the diaries, not just of Worsley, but of James as well, uh, in order to determine where we should look. Uh, but also in, in uh, here I've had, um, there was a Scotsman, I, I'm from Scotland myself, so slight bias, uh, but a Scotsman wordy uh, on the expedition uh, and one of his descendants, um, Philip, a word, you kind of I remember a very excited message. So the, the tremendous enthusiasm uh, there. And people are kind of, sorry, I'm switching it away to the, the next part of the question. I, I've been quite struck how many of the messages I have received um, say, and we're looking forward to the documentary. Um, so there's a lot of excitement about the documentary. Those involved in making it think it's going to be a really kind of interesting, really kind of successful, uh, and, and will bring out the achievement of the people um, in particular on, on the ship. Um, so so yeah. I, I, I wanted to, um, to, to see if we could bring back Mr. Tomlinson's class. I see you're, you're coming back. Um, Mr. Tomlinson's class, actually, they, they ran down to get some lunch and a, few, and a, a number of them came back because they wanted to, to hear from you. Um, and I and I believe that someone has a has a question um, has a question for you, Donald, about that. Sure. Yep. How, how did you feel? How did you and your, the crew feel when you found the endurance? <laughs> well, it's it's quite interesting, actually. Um, I mentioned the relative um, Philippa Wordy. Uh, Hey, and I right. responded to her message, which was of congratulations and excitement. And so, but hers was, I think, the only one that said to me, I bet you felt relief. Hmm? So, yes, you're excited, but actually you're relieved. And why? Because 
what would it mean for Manson, for John, for Captain Knowledge, for others, if they went to all that effort, put in all that planning, and didn't find the wreck? It would have been really difficult for them, uh, I think, to, to come to terms with that. So you're excited. You're delighted uh, that it has been found, but you're also relieved for them uh, because of how negative it would have been if so, they're not correct. And I, I think, um, was it you, Chris? I think, you know, you use the word luck. And I think that is right, as well as all the skill uh, that goes into it. It's like any, any sport. Kind of back to the sport you play, you may you may have skilled players, you may have talent, whatever. You need a bit of luck as mm -hmm. well uh, if you're going to win against you know good opponents or dangerous opponents like ice and COVID. And, uh, and, and so I think the relief piece, though, I want to just quickly mention that because I I think it's important to mention two things based on on what that was. Number one, that big difference between the Endurance Twenty Two expedition and the the Imperial Trans. Antarctic expedition of 1915 is that Sh Shackleton owned endurance. He, he, it was his ship or, or his ship to command um, as the expedition leader. Uh, you did not own the S.A. Agullis too. Um, it was, it was leased. It was rented um, that it was, it was chartered for this particular purpose. And you had to make a pretty important decision. You and the rest of the trust um, and as well as the expedition itself because the you you knew you needed a little bit more time. Could you just briefly touch on that? Because I think that's a little bit of an untold story about that, the importance of that relief feeling. It, it is. I mean, quite early in the expedition, uh, people saw something on the seabed. Uh, and got quite excited about what they had found. And I may know more once they all come back. I don't think we know exactly what it was, but it was pretty clear that it must be from endurance. So we thought, well, we're looking in the right area. Um, and so the search was then... Um, the way it was being conducted was adapted to the fact that we'd found this material on the seabed, and that was at least some sort of guide. But is it material that would have fallen before the ship sank, or while the ship was sinking, or or what? Um, so you have a degree of uncertainty, uh, and you carry on. You know your time is limited. Uh, we had the opportunity under the contract, the agreement we had um, for use of the ship, there was uh, the, the ability to extend that by a few days. Um, and so we, you know, we took advantage of, of that extension. But as the clock is running out and you have maybe three, maybe four days left, the, the tension mounts, you know, are we going to succeed? Or will we have come so close but not succeed? Um, and I think I'll know more when when everyone is kind of um, all the relevant people are, are back in in the UK, you know, to ask them actually how was it? How were the emotions um, at at that time? And that is going to be, a, I'm sure, a thrilling part of the documentary. How people react as the tension mounts and uh, you know all the emotions um, are quite difficult. Some will be very confident. Others will think, I don't think we're going to do it. Um, and uh, it's easier for me. I was several thousand miles away. But, but when success came, relief for me and for those on the ship was a, really a large part of what we felt. I, I will admit I was very optimistic that it was found. I was I was trying I was trying to keep my spirits up as we were we were not hearing anything day by day. Um, so I was very glad. <laughs> I was very I felt similarly relieved. Uh, we have on screen here just some of the amazing announcement stories uh, of that. And 
um, you know, the, our, our local paper here, the New York Times, the, that, that seeing that last Wednesday was, was a, a really, really amazing moment, I know, for all of us here at Reach the World. Um, so I, um, we are running low on time, so I, I do want to bring on Mr. Tomlinson's fourth grade class, um, especially because you all have, um, you all have decided to, to stick with us for a little bit longer. You, you, you're sitting through your lunch. Um, so if, if you could maybe just come a little bit closer to the, to the screen so we can see you. Um, and and um, what we'll do as we close out, let's, let's give a big wave and, um, and maybe a, 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 a one, two, three, thank you for Donald for being here. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, you're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right, she's on her way. Okay. Here we are. You get it? What? Am I ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite part of the expedition? Okay, let's Ooh. close it out on that question. How about that? <laughs> oh, I mean, this is, I'm almost going to avoid your question because uh, I said to, to someone recently that somebody might say, okay, now we found it, now the work begins. Because the documentary is being made, but there's also so much information gathered by the Sabretooths, by their sensors, that I haven't seen, um, but that will enable us to do, whoa, to produce 3D models, to produce holograms, to kind of, for display in museums or art galleries, on school, in schools, and so on. So there's a heck of a lot of exciting stuff. And I know nothing about that kind of um, field. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a diplomat. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I'm going to be learning a huge amount uh, in, uh, in the months to come. Uh, and, and for that matter, the, maybe the... that will turn out to be my favorite part, but we'll see. <laughs> And for that matter, the, the the biology, right? To be able to take some of those amazing high-res images that we've gotten, the, the 4K footage, all of that additional image, we've only scratched the proverbial surface of what we're, we've been able to see on that wreck. And, and um, some of the coverage that I've read personally has said that there might be some new species of, of, yep. of deep sea animals that have been found that happen to find themselves on the endurance. Um, so... Um, but with that, Donald, I, 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 we are we are low on time. I, on behalf of Reach the World, on behalf of all of our guests from around the world who have been joining the live stream today, those of us, uh, those people who will be joining us in the future, um, hello to the future. Uh, we we really appreciate you all being here. Um, I I see Mr. Tomlinson's class is on here. Let's let's give Donald a big wave, and if you can unmute just to just say give a, a nice uh, nice big thank you to Mr. Uh, to yes. Mr. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very Wonderful. much for your interest. Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you so much. And and also on behalf of um, our friends in in New Jersey, uh, who had to also skip out to lunch a little bit early, um, I, I do want to extend a hearty thank you. They were they were they absolutely loved the conversation as well. But to everyone, we really appreciate um, you being here, Donald. Thank you so much for your time and uh, and for and for sharing with us a little bit of the in incredible planning that goes into. Uh, such an amazing expedition, especially one that has has been so successful, such as this. Um, well, th yeah, thank thank you, Chris, kind of for this uh, for this time, but also congratulations to uh, to reach the world and kind of what you've uh, uh, put together and um, uh, the, the, what has come back from Tim. I mean, I I I have not had the time to look at everything that has come back, but I've you kind know, of dipped in, uh, and and it has been kind of fantastic. So. Uh, we're kind of really kind of in the trust, very kind of happy and proud of what you've been uh, been able to do and the the reach that uh, that you've uh, that you've had. So thank you uh, for uh, that. It was very it, important part, as I've said, of our planning. It's it it it, it has been just an, an incredible experience for us, and I know I, I am not um, speaking out of turn on behalf of Tim to to say that. And and just like what it is for the entire expedition and for the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust. The expedition continues for us. We have we are we have a lot more footage we know from Tim that he's excited to share with us. Um, he has a video that he's going to be sharing with us early next week from South Georgia Island from from the chance he's showing us the uh, a little bit of what that that absolutely stunning place is. We also have a little bit of a brief um, a brief conversation with Tim on their last day on the ice. 
um, which we will be releasing soon. So we're gonna we're gonna go through some of that footage and so much else. So we we're really excited to continue the expedition as well and to continue those conversations, share resources, uh, and to and to con and 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 inspire pe people young and old um, to to be following this absolutely wonderful expedition. So with that, thank you, Donald. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And um, and until next week, this is. Thank you very much.